Paul Harvey, a radio broadcaster for ABC News Radio, told a story about a three-year-old boy who went to the grocery store with his mother. Before they entered, she had one rule for her child, you're not getting any chocolate chip cookies, so don't even ask. She put him in the child's seat and off they went, up and down the aisles, and he was doing just fine until he, they came to the cookie section. Seeing the chocolate chip cookies, he, he said, Mom, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? She answered, I told you don't ask, you're not going to get any. They continued up and down the aisles, but in their search for certain items, they realized they had to backtrack, and they ended up in the cookie aisle again. Mom, can I please have some chocolate chip cookies? She said, I told you, you can't have any. Now sit down and be quiet. Finally, they arrived at the checkout. The little boy sensed that the end was near, and this might be his last chance. So he stood up on the seat, and he shouted, In the name of Jesus, may I have some chocolate chip cookies? Everyone in the checkout lanes laughed and applauded. And do you think that little boy got his cookies? He did. The other shoppers were so moved by this effort that they pulled their resources, and the little boy and his mother left with 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies that day. Today we're talking about prayer. We all know that prayer doesn't always happen like it did for this little guy and his desperate plea for cookies. Sometimes, yes, we do ask for God and we do receive in abundance, but not always. Is that even the point of prayer? Our direct lifeline to God, our ability to phone a friend, like in that game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Our lifeline for a million dollars. Is it wrong to pray for chocolate chip cookies? Like in all things, I believe the Bible has answers for us. Maybe not about chocolate chip cookies specifically, but maybe we'll find a way to answer that one too. So welcome to Prayer 101. Consider today your crash course in prayer. How should we pray and what should we say? What should we pray for? Why should we pray? That's what we're here to find out, so let's begin. Have you ever thought to yourself that maybe you should probably pray, but you really don't know how? You don't know how to start, what to say? Well, you're not alone. In fact, in today's reading, one of Jesus' own disciples fessed up to the very same feelings. From Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Now we all know that one, don't we? We probably memorized it as children, although most likely a longer version. We say it every week in church. But what is Jesus telling us here? Is this the best way to pray since... This is specifically how Jesus answered when he was asked. You know, there is a template that we can learn from in this prayer, and I wouldn't be a good United Methodist if I didn't mention John Wesley in at least one of my sermons, so here we go. He suggests that this prayer can be divided, divided into three parts, the preface, the petitions, and the conclusion. In the preface, he says, our Father, who art in heaven, lays a general foundation for prayer. It, compri it comprises what we must first know of God before we can pray in confidence of being heard. The second part is the petitions, and so to speak, this makes up the meat of the Lord's Prayer. Wesley notes that these include that God's name be hallowed, that his kingdom come, that his will is done, and that he gives us our daily bread. And by the way, the bread that we're talking about here 
is both physical and spiritual, that that we need for our souls and that that we need for our bodies to be nourished. And finally, the conclusion. This is what makes God the authority we should pray to, the ruler of the kingdom, the executive power, and the one to whom all praise is due. We can follow this template in our own prayers. We can pray to God in the same way by starting with our own preface, including our own petitions, and then our own conclusion as well. But I believe that Jesus is showing us another way to pray, and wouldn't it be very much like Jesus to deliver a multi-layered answer to this question? When he is asked how to pray, Jesus doesn't ask for five minutes to gather up his thoughts, maybe to jot some things down that he wants to be sure to say. He doesn't need to practice or draft up an outline. No, he just prays. He just goes for it. I think that in itself is a good example. Tom Long is a professor of preaching at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. A pastor friend of Long's received a call one day. A staff member at his church had been mugged while walking his dog in his very own neighborhood. He had been stabbed and left for dead. He was now in intensive care, and the outlook was grim. As the rest of the staff heard, they began to gather spontaneously in their sanctuary to pray around their communion table. And one by one, they prayed sincere prayers, all from their hearts. They prayed for comfort, and they prayed for changed hearts. But they all seemed to accept that this man was about to die. Then the custodian prayed. Long's pastor friend recalled that this janitor prayed one of the most intense prayers he's ever witnessed. He waved his finger at God. He shouted and shook, you've got to save him. You can't just let him die. The custodian practically screamed at God. You've done it many times, Lord. You've done it for others. You've done it for me. I am begging you, do it again. Do it for him. Save him, Lord. Long's friend later said that it was as if he grabbed God by the lapels and refused to let God loose until God came down with healing wings. And when they heard that prayer, he said, we just knew God would indeed come to heal. And guess what? The man was indeed healed. Now, we could debate whether or not that custodian's theatrics were the catalyst for that man's healing. Maybe a more reserved prayer would have also done the trick. Maybe it was all of them praying together. But the point here, at least to me, is that this custodian went for it. He just prayed. He prayed from his heart. It wasn't scripted, and it wasn't thought out or planned. It didn't follow any template. He just prayed. And that's, I think, what Jesus did that day. Granted, his prayer was beautiful and eloquent, but I don't believe that God is waiting for us to pray the next Lord's Prayer. I believe God wants us to be like that custodian, and even if you aren't shaking and shouting, waving your hands and pointing your fingers, just go for it. Speak to God from your heart, from your soul, and just pray. So now that we're ready to pray, what do we ask for? Do we ask for that lifeline for the million dollar question on a game show? Do we ask for chocolate chip cookies? Well, the short answer is yes. You certainly can pray for any of those things. Do you need any of those things, though, That's maybe a different question. Let's go back to our gospel reading. Verses 5 through 8 say, Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine 
on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Notice that last line, because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. First of all, that shameless audacity part. We can go back to both of our previous examples to understand this. What did our custodian and our little boy have in common? They were bold. They knew what they needed, and they didn't shy away from asking for it. There was certainly no shame in their asking. Audacity can, give, can take a few different meanings. It's probably more recognized as a term meaning rude or disrespectful behavior. There were probably one or two people in that grocery store that maybe said under their breath, the audacity of that kid to yell for cookies like that. But it can also mean a willingness to take bold risks. Some synonyms for this meaning, boldness, daring, fearlessness, bravery, courage. Jesus is telling you right here, be bold and don't be embarrassed. I realize I'm kind of back to talking about how we should pray, so let's move forward to that next part in the last line, as much as you need. You won't get everything that you desire. God isn't a genie. But if you boldly, if you boldly and shamelessly ask for what you need, your prayer will be heard. What you need might not be what you asked for, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So what should we pray for? A million dollars? Now, I don't know about you, but I could certainly use a million dollars. I could even put it to good use, and I'm not even talking about the baseball cards that I talked about last week. But maybe I don't need a million dollars. What if that person on that game show is solely there to save their church? It's the last open church in an old, aging town, and if this one has to close their doors, that person fears that so many will lose their church and maybe fall away from God. But they're so far in debt, they have so many repairs to make, and this person is there because they want to win this game and save their church. Then what does that prayer mean? Now, maybe the answer to that prayer is still God saying, I, I don't think you need a million dollars, but listen to me, and I'll light another path for you. The chocolate chip cookies? Well, let's consider this story as told by Dr. Tim Bruster. One day, a mom took her children to a crowded restaurant. Her six-year-old son asked if he could say the blessing, and so he began to pray. God is great and God is good. Let us thank him for this food. And God, I would thank you even more if mom got us ice cream for dessert and liberty and justice for all. Amen. <laughs> Many in that restaurant laughed and smiled, but a woman at the very next table grumbled just loudly enough to be heard. That's what's wrong with our country. Kids today don't even know how to pray. The very idea of asking God for ice cream. Now, naturally, this boy was crushed. He began to cry to his mother, and he asked if he did it wrong, if God was mad at him. His mother pulled him close, and she told him he did a wonderful job and that God was definitely not mad at him. An older gentleman walked over, smiling at the boy. He said, I know God really well, and I talk to him every day. I happen to know that God loved your prayer, it may have been the best one he's heard all day. Really? The little boy asked him. Cross my heart, said the man. Then he leaned over, pointed at that woman at the next table, and whispered in his ear, Too bad she never asks for God, uh, God for ice cream. A little ice cream is good for the soul sometimes. 
Of course, after all of this, the boy did indeed get his ice cream. But when it was right in front of him, he just kind of stared at it. And without being prompted and without even saying a word, he got up, took his ice cream over to, and placed it right in front of the woman at the next table and said, Here, this is for you. Ice cream is good for the soul sometimes, and my soul is good already. I think that boy's prayer for ice cream was answered quite loudly, don't you? And maybe he didn't need that ice cream, but God knew his soul, knew that it was good already, and he knew that that boy could indeed use that ice cream. So what do we pray for? We pray for what we need. We pray for what we need for others. And when we ask with shameless audacity, when our souls are good, In one way or another, that prayer is answered. Moving on, let's see what the last part of our gospel says about why we should pray. From verses 9 through 13. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks The doors are opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We have a good Father in heaven who knows how to give good gifts. I think that's a great reason for us to pray, don't you? So I'll just put it plainly. We should pray because prayer works. This can be hard to understand because sometimes it feels like we don't get an answer at all. Sometimes we think we ask for what we need, but we get a different answer. We may think that God ignored our prayers, only to find out later, sometimes much later, that it was indeed answered. Sometimes it can feel like God isn't giving us those good gifts. Sometimes we pray desperately for healing that never comes. But maybe the answer to that prayer actually is healing. Maybe God answers by providing eternal healing, and then, in time... By healing our own hearts. Sometimes the answer to our prayer is ourselves. One of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, and don't think that that's the last time that you'll hear that name as I stand up here week by week, once wrote in a letter in 1956, I fully agree that thy will be done should principally be taken in the sense that God's will has blank well got to be done even if I have to go and do it myself. Sometimes we pray for a revival for our church. I'm praying for that. Maybe the answer to our prayer for God to intervene means that we need to get out of our pews and do something about it. Sometimes we pray for chocolate chip cookies. Maybe the answer to that prayer is for them to unite people in a grocery store in happiness, laughter, and a giving spirit. Ask and you'll receive... Seek and you'll find. Knock and the doors will be opened. It might not be exactly what you asked for, but you will receive. It might not be exactly what you were seeking, but you'll find it. It might not be the door that you wanted to open, but it will be opened to you. No matter how your prayers are answered in beautifully splendid ways, or in subtle ways that are easy to miss or to misunderstand, prayer does work. Ask God for what you need. It works. And when those questions are answered, and that which is sought is found, when doors are opened, we know that God doesn't give gifts of snakes or scorpions, because we as humans wouldn't even give those gifts. So imagine how much more the gifts of God will be. How should we pray? 
Whether you have a beautifully structured prayer or you pour out your soul in the spur of the moment or somewhere in between, just pray. What should we pray for? We pray for what we believe in our soul that we need. Why should we pray? Because even if the answers to your prayer aren't what you were hoping for, prayer works. Amen.